Hello, uh, welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, today we have a very distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Martha Schupin, who's a psychiatrist, and we're going to look at the mental health risks associated with abortion. Uh, back several years ago, the American, uh, I think it was Psychological Association, failed to assess that uh, or put together that there are mental health issues involved with abortion. And uh, Dr. Schuping has been one of the lead researchers in this regard uh, with uh, academic research. And we welcome Dr. Schuping. Great to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Schuping, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what has been going on uh, as far as uh, studies with women? Uh, did, where did you first see the problems where there might be uh, psychological problems going on with uh, post-abortive women? I actually first saw this with my own patients when I was in training. And actually, as a young woman, I had done abortion referrals. I was taught that this was women's right to choose and this was helping women. And so I took one evening of training when I was an undergraduate and learned to tell women, no, no problem, no side effects, don't worry about it. Here's, here's where you go and get your abortion. But when I was in training myself, I saw it wasn't that way at all and that many women are having abortions they don't want to please other people or under extensive pressure from other people. And a lot of these women are suffering greatly. So I had a patient which completely surprised me. She was a married woman in a happy marriage, what had been a happy marriage, and they were financially well off. She was a stay-at-home mom. She was happy with her family and was pregnant again to have another child. And she was thrilled and delighted and she was shocked to find out that her husband did not want this baby. And he was a professional. The income was not the issue. But he said, you know, we've got our family. We're maxed. Let's just let this one go. I, I don't want to spend the energy to have another baby right now. And so she was very pressured. She actually went to her pastor. And the husband and wife went to the, the minister to discuss it. And the minister joined in with the husband and said, well, you know, if your husband doesn't want this, you should go along with him. And so she caved, but it wasn't what she wanted at all. And after her abortion, she found herself admitted to the hospital because she was having suicidal thoughts. She was at risk for suicide. And at that point, she was not able to get out of bed to face the day. She could not get up to take care of her living children. She'd stay awake all night crying and then just not have the energy to do what she needed to do during the day. And she could recognize in herself that she had been happy. She had been a well woman, and this was totally out of the blue to her that her husband would not have wanted another child. And she was devastated. She needed medication for depression. But at the time, I felt like, you know, there's more here than just something that a little, you know, antidepressant is going to fix. And that was my introduction to bringing in a support group person to talk to her. And I just realized, you know, everybody, in fact, my supervisor said, it's not the abortion. She's just obsessing about it because of some other reason. But, you know, she was fine, and then she had the abortion, and she was in the hospital. And she, she knew that something was different. She truly believed that she'd committed an unforgivable sin, her pastor notwithstanding. And it was, it was just a devastating loss to her. So that's when I started to see this. But I've seen it again and again as people have come to me, and they've had these kinds of losses, and they're not happy about their abortion. It wasn't an easy, painless choice for them. And it's just, a, it, it's cruel, really, that women are not being given that informed consent. What the research is showing is that many, many, many women are aborting babies they wanted, and they're doing so when only about 10% or so say they've had adequate counseling. And so that's the first thing that ought to be taking place is actual informed consent. But it's misleading to cover it up and pretend that nobody has problems after abortion when it's really not that way at all. Uh-huh. And um, the, uh, now I, uh, uh, one of the things that had gotten me uh, going on this was uh, we had a, a, an annual meeting in the summer, I, I'm going to say 2008, of the American Psychological Association here in Boston. And they seemed to, one of their very first decrees was that uh, they said that there were really no effects, uh, bad effects, harmful effects of, uh, of having an abortion and uh, on mental health. And uh, I, I viscerally disagreed because I had a lot of uh, people on this show that uh, told me they were post-abortive women, that they had some of these uh, effects, you know, drinking and drugs and 
suicidal thoughts. What, uh, what do you make of the American Psychological Association coming up with a, a, a decree like that? I think that they are so politically and ideologically committed to the idea of keeping abortion easily available that it has blinded them and really caused them to take a position that's against the science. And I believe that that report was intentionally misleading. Now, the way that the conclusion was worded, the conclusion that indicated that there's no real problem, they specified very carefully that they're only talking about adult women. That was very clear in their conclusion. The reason they said adult women is they know that younger women have more problems, and that is clear from the literature. Even in abortion providers' materials, I, have a, I own a textbook that was designed to teach abortion providers how to do good abortions, how to do it surgically the right way, how to counsel the patients beforehand. Even in that book, it mentions that adolescents just don't do as well. That's a risk factor for having adverse outcomes. So even the providers in their own textbook have said that some women have adverse outcomes. And one of the things you want to avoid is you know, the younger women, because they do have more problems. So in the APA report, they discussed that in the body of their report. They said, well, we know that younger women have more problems. The under 21, they might have more risk of having an adverse effect. So we're not talking about them in our conclusion. We're only talking about adult women. So right there, they've eliminated a big chunk. They've eliminated some number of hundreds of thousands of young women. But the next thing they said was, and we're only talking about people who have one abortion, a single abortion in an adult woman, because they mentioned within the body of their report, they know that women who have multiple abortions, and we know that women can, I've personally known women who have 10, 12, 13 abortions, they know that women who have multiple abortions have more mental health problems also. But here's the thing. The Guttmacher Institute shows that about half of all women who show up in an abortion clinic have already had one abortion. These are repeat abortions. Now, many times we shouldn't judge the women because they're having it perhaps because of pressure from others. They may be having it because they have so much trauma from the first abortion that it's upsetting and distressing to them to be pregnant again, and they just can't even think clearly. But the reality is that about half of all women are having repeat abortions when they go for, for that abortion. And so we know that half of those women are at greater risk. They've got more mental health problems. But the APA has said, well, we're going to push those aside and not talk about them because we, we want to keep our good conclusion and say that there's no problem. So they've eliminated the young women. They've eliminated the repeat abortions. So now they've already eliminated more than half of the women that they're going to consider because they said we're not talking about them in our conclusion. But the next thing that they did they, they kind of don't mention it, but they do mention within the body of their report that they know that if women abort babies they want, goodness, yes, they say very clearly, if women are aborting wanted babies, then yes, we know they have mental health problems after abortion. But where they're mistaken, and perhaps they just can't see it, is that there are many people who have unplanned pregnancies, but nonetheless, they want their babies. And there's a lot of data on that. There's a lot of research that show that even when the abortion is being chosen, that women often have bonded to those babies, they're talking to their babies, they're rubbing their bellies and apologizing to their babies, and that's in the published literature. So they're not making that connection that there's a lot of unwanted pregnancy, un unintended pregnancies, but the baby is wanted nonetheless. And so... In, in, within their report, they're talking about the fact that, yes, of course those women would have more problems. Isn't that tragic? But they're not thinking about that when they make their conclusion because the conclusion is really applying to women who they think had an unwanted pregnancy, who had one abortion, they're adult women who are over 21. And for those women, they claim that there's no problem. But the other thing that they don't really um, tell you there is that they've really eliminated most of the world literature on abortion because on the one hand they're they're a little bit cherry picking and saying well we're only going to go with studies from the US we don't want to look at all these foreign studies and so they eliminated a study from 2007 now remember their report was in 2008 but in 2007 there was a study on post traumatic stress disorder 
in women after abortion, and it was done by abortion doctors in South Africa at a Marie Stopes clinic, which is a big international chain. Abortion chain. Yes, it's an abortion chain, and the doctors there were worried because so many of their women were having post-traumatic stress after abortion, and they wanted to do something about it. And they speculated in their article, you know, is it because they're seeing stuff during the abortion? Is it because of the blood and the pain? And if we gave them anesthesia, would this help them? If we gave different anesthesia, can we compare? So they compared two different modes of anesthesia, to see whether this would make a difference and reduce the number of women having post-traumatic stress after abortion. But what they found was the anesthesia didn't really make any difference, that women were still having post-traumatic stress disorder after their abortion. And what they came up with was about 18% of their women were impacted. Now, to give you just by way of comparison, there was a U.S. government study of men who'd been in combat in Vietnam 15% of them came back with post-traumatic stress disorder, and we thought that was a big problem, and it is for the men who have it. It was disabling. It was terrible. We had to, you know, provide treatment for those men. But these South African doctors found that women at the Marie Stopes Clinic and women in the hospital there, 18% of them, and the authors make the point that's almost one in five had post-traumatic stress disorder at three months after the abortion. And they considered that the authors themselves, the abortion doctors, considered that high. They were worried about those women. And yet, the APA chose not to include that study because it was a foreign study, but surely they knew about it. But they did quite a song and dance about um, there's no such thing as post-traumatic stress after abortion. It doesn't happen. That's something pro-lifers made up. Well, anybody can Google that article, 2007 Suleiman, S-U-L-I-M-A-N, and just read the abstract and see what it says. They considered that high. They're talking about post-traumatic stress after abortion. So I think it's very disingenuous of the APA to pretend that this is just something that pro-lifers made up. Now, there are pro-life researchers who have also found data that is consistent with what the South African researchers found. There's some American studies where they found 14 to 19 percent in that range. There's some other studies that have found higher, and it kind of, you know, there's different ways that you can organize and set up a study, but I think that that's really quite confirming that pro-life researchers in the United States had come up with data that was quite similar to what the abortion doctors themselves had found. Mm. Uh, uh, is there, for instance, uh, the, um, the ACOG, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, there's a subset pro-life group called APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Is there any similar organization of psychiatrists or psychologists that are are fighting the uh, APA as far as um, their shunning uh, the idea that there really is a lot of mental health issues involved with post-traumatic, uh, uh, post-abortive women? Well, there is an American Association of Christian Counselors, which has recently set up a subsection that's specifically devoted to counselors who have an interest in um, a range of reproductive issues as they affect mental health, and that would be things like pregnancy loss, which I think could include miscarriage or abortion, as well as sexual abuse issues and things like that. So I think this is becoming known in some circles, and certainly the counselors who self-identify themselves as Christian have some understanding and a growing awareness of the need that women have for help with this issue. But as far as at the national level kind of mainstream psychology, The mainstream psychology is with the APA, and I think they're not informed, and it's hard to be informed when there's kind of a bureaucracy in place that that wants ideology to trump science, and and when this, you know, it's it's put out there, and you don't always hear that dissent because it's not tolerated, and I think that's also true to a large extent in the American Psychiatric Association. There's not. there's not an organization of, of psychiatrists that that are um, trying to take a different stream with this. I think to a large extent it's ignored, but when it's talked about, the party line is that there's not a problem. And that's just, it's sad for women because there are women who need help. And the end result, when you say that there's no problem, then you're not working on treatment protocols that will help with this. And so what we're left with in in some ways it's good. What we're left with is that treatment is not really in the hands of psychologists who think it's a myth. Treatment is very much 
in the peer support groups where women are helping women, women who have been through these experiences themselves and have found a place of healing, often that is through a faith-based program more often than not. And there are many, many good faith-based programs, and there are self-identified Christian therapists and Catholic therapists who will will help women who participate in these groups. One of the ones that I like very much is Rachel's Vineyard, and that's a particularly nice program. Uh, there's a lot of good things about it, but each Rachel's Vineyard team includes a mental health professional as well as women who are peer counselors who are you know, they've been through it themselves. They are post-abortive, but they're they're healed and recovered, and they want to help other people. And so it's a mix, including clergy also. There's a team approach so that, so that women, in a supportive setting without any judgment, they can work through these issues and recover from the horrible experience that they've had for those who have. And I will say there may be women, I, I use the word horrible because that's what many women experience, some women say they didn't have a problem, and I can't speak for every woman, but I can say that the women who come to me have had some very, very distressing experiences. They have not found closure, and I think that's really more widespread than people realize. I think there's there's one other study that I want to mention that comes to mind. There was a study in England of women who were now at the age of menopause, and this came out I think in the latter part of 2010, I believe it was October of 2010, and the lead author was someone named Dykes. But these were women who had abortions when they were young women. Now they're at the age of menopause, and they're doing in-depth interviews with these women as a study to say, well, how do you feel about it now? What are you thinking? Was it a good choice? And every one of those women said they missed their baby. They say, I think about that child every day. I wonder what it would look like. How old would it be? Each year on the anniversary, I count those birthdays. And, you know, it's something that one woman used the term. She said, it haunts me. And the women also express very negative self-image about themselves. They say, well, you know, it's just one more thing I have to hate about myself. And, um, you know, I tell people, don't say bad things about women who've had abortions. Don't use this term or that that term. You know, we want to be very non-judgmental toward them. But the women themselves said very hateful, judgmental things about themselves for having had that abortion. So this is looking back in a culture that widely accepts abortion, and, you know, in a, in a situation where it had been legal, they still, they had that pain. And so I know that there's a lot of that out there. And I, I am thankful that we do have these faith-based programs that are doing a good job, but we don't have treatment that's been um, studied extensively the way you would normally, you know, for... for um, for rape victims, even you look and you see that there's support groups, there's programs. If somebody says we've been, they've been raped and they have a problem, we know what to plug them into and we know how to help. And for abortion, people can say, well, here's here's some medicine for you, and it's probably something else because abortion doesn't do this. And so people people need to turn. You know, women need to have the help and support of other women, and they really need um, the faith based programs for what they offer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've, I've uh, noted that, um, uh, or I read somewhere, that women who've had abortion have a much higher death rate than those that give childbirth. Can you speak to that a little bit? Why is that so? Well, there is definitely a higher suicide rate among women who've had abortions. And there was a study in Finland where they've got socialized medicine so they can get the actual medical records whether the, to find out whether there's been a pregnancy, whether there's been an abortion or a miscarriage, and you can also tie that to the death certificates. And so uh, Mika Gissler in Finland, uh, the Finnish data was used, and some of this was published in the British Medical Journal, I believe, um, but it was, it was published in the United Kingdom anyway, that um, they found six six times the rate of suicide among women who had abortions compared to women who delivered babies. Now, some people said, oh, that, you know, they didn't control for this or that. We need to take another look. They'd, they'd pick and find, the, you know, something they didn't like about it. So David Reardon did a study where they took more than about 173,000 California Medicaid women. They took those records, and in this case, they could control for prior psychiatric problems. They could, they could look at those records and say, well, did this person already have a mental illness? 
and then they looked at the death rate by suicide over an eight-year period, and they could see that the women who had abortions did have a higher suicide rate, and it carried through on the whole eight years of the study that, that the women who had the abortion were more suicide vulnerable. Now, another thing that can happen is Gisler also found, using the medical records and the death certificates, found that women had a higher accident accidental death rate. And the accidents, you don't know, were they just, for instance, drunk driving? Because we do know that there's a higher risk of substance abuse after abortion. So could they have been drunk driving and then they got in an accident and it just was a pure accident? Or could it have been suicide without the note? And we really don't know. All we can say for sure is the accidental death is higher. But the thing that I do know um, in the book Forbidden Grief by Teresa Burke, she talks about case after case. For instance, one woman saying, you know, I tried several times to kill myself by drunk driving, and I tried to drive into something. I had all these wrecks. I broke my ribs. This and that happened. And people talk about very self-destructive behavior because of the self-hatred after the abortion. And, of course, substance abuse factors in. Priscilla Coleman has done a lot of research on how much substance abuse there is and how it's increased after abortion. And so, you know, we don't know all the factors. It's not only the accidental deaths and the suicides, but for some reason just the death rate in general has gone up after abortion among those women. And I don't know that we have all the explanations except perhaps partly the response of the body to stress. That that may be something that factors in. I think there's a lot that we still, you know, could learn that we don't know yet. But certainly there is a higher death rate for women who've had abortions. I see. And can I ask you about uh, when women uh, who've had an abortion, uh, I I know that their cervix has been compromised a lot of times, making it less able to carry a baby the next time with preemie births. And I know that the, I guess there's a higher death rate with preemie births and there's cerebral palsy. How do women, when they find out about all this after they've had an abortion, what happens? To, I'm sure they're not too happy, but maybe you could speak to this. I think a lot of women don't realize that because this is another thing where it's been so politicized in medicine that no one wants to talk about it. And I don't think that the majority of women are informed. You know, certainly when they go to have an abortion, the doctor is not going to say, well, you know, you might have cervical problems afterwards. You could have one of those very early premature babies that's born with multiple handicaps, maybe cerebral palsy, which is definitely increased after an abortion. You know, they're not warned that. And probably the doctor who delivers the baby isn't going to say, he's not going to turn around and say after they have a handicapped baby, oh, well, you know, this is because of your abortion. You know, that's not going to happen. They're not going to say that. And so... um I know that there are some doctors who will warn women, and, and this is, this is um, talked about within APLOG. Some doctors will say, you know what, you had a previous abortion, you are high risk, we're going to treat it that way, we're going to do everything possible to give you a healthy outcome, but you know, you are at increased risk for cerebral palsy. And they want women to know because there have been so many lawsuits for babies born with cerebral palsy when it was nothing that the obstetrician who delivered the baby had any control over it, the prior damage from the abortion. And there are more than 100 studies that show that connection, the increased risk of a very preterm baby that is then at risk for cerebral palsy, that that risk is, is increased after the abortion. More than 100 studies, more than a million cases. I don't even know what it's up to now, but they just, people have done studies in, in almost every country, numerous countries, um, large European studies, studies in Australia, studies in the United States, and um, there, there really are, they can actually quantify and say how many babies, and it's thousands of babies in the United States and a cost of billions of dollars, um, due to those preterm births. I noticed that uh, uh, on the, the lady who's uh, Gretchen uh, Carlson, who's on Fox News in the morning, she's the uh, head of the March of Dimes, or you know, she's lending her name to it, and they have shifted over to premature babies and premature deaths and what they originally stood for, yet... Uh, they don't seem to bring up the cause of uh, prior abortions as a reason for premature births. What do you think of that? No, I know that nobody wants to, and yet it's in. There's a book published by the Institute of Medicine, which is highly respected in the United States, and even in, in that book it says that induced abortion is an immutable risk factor 
for preterm birth. And it says that very clearly, that if you want to prevent pre... Basically, what it's saying is if you want to prevent preterm birth, this is one of the risk factors. That's something that increases the risk of having that problem, and it's immutable, something you can't... Once you've had the abortion, you can't change that. There it is. You can't change it. And so people, I think, should be warned fairly, but... That's not happening. Nobody wants to talk about it. But um, there's a Dr. Calhoun, Byron Calhoun, who has done some of the research. He wrote a review paper on this, I think, in 2003, and then later he published um, a study in which he broke down a lot of statistics and pointed out how many babies in in the United States are being affected because there is a, a large number. Well, Dr. Shuping, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and uh, making the, it a very uh, informative show. And we, want to hope, we hope that you, our listening audience, uh, found our show today to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life.